Good afternoon and welcome to this edition of Ask the Physical Therapist. I'm Sherry Bins, the Patient Healthcare Liaison for the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation, and we have here today with us Dr. Herb Karpatkin, who is our physical therapist on our Medical Advisory Council. Um, Dr. Karpatkin received his master's degree in physical therapy from Boston University and then a doctorate in neurology from Rocky Mountain University. He's board certified in both neurology and geriatrics and is a certified multiple sclerosis specialist. He has held clinical posts at the Rusk Institute of Rehabilitation Medicine, Burke Rehabilitation Hospital, and the International Multiple Sclerosis Management Practice, in addition to academic posts in physical therapy departments of Turo and Hunter Colleges. He's presented extensively, both nationally and internationally, on physical therapy and multiple sclerosis and has published numerous articles on MS. In addition to continuing to be actively involved in patient care, he is a tenured associate professor of physical therapy at Hunter College, City University of New York, teaching courses in neurologic evaluation, intervention, and psychosocial aspects of healthcare, as well as research design. Now, um, if you're joining us on Zoom and have a question regarding physical therapy for Dr. Karpatkin, um, take it into the question and answer. Um, if we've had a, a lot of uh, activity in recent webinars in the chat, I would discourage that right now because what we really need to do is to keep that chat open so that links that people mention can be clicked into the chat for everybody to see. And also it's available for any messages that come in from our Facebook Live. So if you'd please ask your question in the Q&A. Um, if you need to ask him a question specifically, raise your hand. It's a little button at the bottom center of your screen, and I will ask you to unmute yourself when it's time to ask your question. So let's see, we've got one question in the Q&A right now, and it's from an anonymous attendee. Um, can you have spasticity around the knee joint area? And if so, what do you recommend to provide better ease of the knee for walking? Sure. Well, spasticity is a relatively common finding in persons with MS. It's a stiffness that is due not to the stiffness in the muscles, but due to getting unusual and abnormal impulses from the brain or spinal cord, which is due to the multiple sclerosis. Um, Spasticity can be in any muscle in the body following MS, and so the muscles surrounding the knee are a pretty typical area for it. Um, I can't really answer your question with, unless I know if the spasticity is due is in the flexors or the muscle that bend the knee, or the extensors, the muscle that straighten the knee, or both. Um, if it's in the flexors. It means the knee is more likely to give out on you. If it's in the extensors, it means it's going to be harder to bend the knee. In terms of the best thing to do is make sure you're getting adequate medication for it and see your physician to make sure that, you're, uh, that you are getting medication in the right amount. The typical medication is usually called baclofen. The role of physical therapist in treating somebody with spasticity is to make sure that the stiffness from the spasticity doesn't make the knee even tighter. So the simplest thing you can do is make sure the muscles in the knee are fully stretched out. This usually means stretching out the hamstrings or the muscles in the back of the knee. Ha spasticity is usually a two-edged sword in MS because, or in anybody, um, because there's the problem, not just of the spasticity itself, but as the spasticity gets the muscles tighter and tighter, the muscles sort of become accustomed to that tightness. And so you have two issues, the spasticity itself and the shortening of the spastic muscles. So the sooner you get it treated, the better. Again, usually it's better treated medically at first, but physical therapy should there be there to make sure 
that your knee does not get even tighter as a result. Thank you. Another anonymous attendee is asking on your thoughts about in-home physical therapy versus in the office for someone who's homebound and transportation is limiting. Well, I'm a little biased because I'm a lot of my practice is home care PT. And I think home care PT is one of the best things for people with MS, partially for the reasons you just brought up that you know, it's, you know, for you just to get from your home to the office is going to take a lot of energy for you. It's going to be a big production, you know, um, for when I, I used to have a private practice and some of my patients said by the time they got to my office, they were already exhausted. So I think it makes much more sense for many MS patients to have a therapist come to their home. The other thing, reason why I think home care is a better option for many MS patients is because home is where you live. You don't live in the practice. You don't live in the hospital. You live in your home. And so if a PT is going to help you live your life, it's best to see where you live, you, where you are when you're living your life. So I'm a big proponent of home care physical therapy, and not just for patients with, uh, with relatively advanced disease, but even with those with mild to moderate disease, because Treating in your home is treating you where you, literally where you live. And so the treatment has a much, much more connection to your real needs. Thank you. Barbara asks, is it more beneficial for people who have MS to see a physical therapist who specializes in MS? If so, is it also helpful for non-MS related things like healing from a broken leg? That is a, just a great question. The short answer is if you have MS, you should definitely make sure you're seeing an MS specialist. In the same way that if, you know, for your physician who's treating you for MS, you wouldn't want to go to a, to a dermatologist or a dentist or, you know, somebody who takes care of kidneys. You want to go to a neurologist who specializes in multiple sclerosis. Same thing is true for physical therapy. There's a lot of physical therapists who are specialized in treating people with MS. A lot of times, a lot of times, my role is to just try to connect the therapists with the patients who need them. If there's related issues um, that are not primary but secondary, such as a fracture or a sprain, any physical therapist who's graduated from an accredited program should know the basics of, handle, of handling something like that. The thing about multiple sclerosis is it's very specialized. It's very unique. It's not you know, a stereotypical condition, and it does take specific training to work with it. So I've heard too many bad stories of people who went to, with MS who went to physical therapy, and the therapists that they saw did not have the training and they didn't know what to do. They made some stuff up, but it was obviously not that helpful. So I think it is of tremendous importance that if you see a PT for your MS, make sure this is somebody who actually has training in MS. It is probably one of the most important physical therapy uh, decisions you can make. If you're gonna be spending the time and energy, make sure you're seeing the right person. Thank you. I think one of the things that, excuse me, Barbara might have been concerned about is that oftentimes when you go into rehab from an injury, such as a fracture, uh -huh. um, you're asked to do a lot of repetitions of something. And with MS, heat intolerance can come into that or muscle fatigue. Um, and so my guess is that that was kind of behind Barbara's question. Right, and, um, and I think you may have addressed that, but from a patient perspective, I've gone in for physical therapy before when, when I've had the physical therapist say, yes, I understand MS completely, and yet <clears throat> I'm given exercises to do in the office, and so I've gotten into a routine of saying, if you want me to do an exercise at home as part of my daily routine, um, show me 
what you want me to do, I'll repeat that, but I'm not going to sit here in the office and take up 45 minutes of your time doing exercise because I get too fatigued doing that. And I, I've i actually had to pull off the road on my way home because I'd forgotten where I was. I was so fatigued. So I think that's something that um, <clears throat> any of our listeners might also factor into that. Um, don't just sit in the office and do exercise as somebody's putting you through the routine. Get in the practice of doing it throughout the day um, in your home. Thank you so much for sharing that because I think that's an excellent point. Firstly, if you see a physical therapist <clears throat> for your MS and they're not aware of fatigue, that means they don't know MS. Right. I mean, um, that's, that is MS 101. If you don't have a physical therapist is not aware that fatigue is the most prominent symptom in persons with MS and certainly the biggest impediment towards getting a good physical exercise program going, then this is solid proof that they really don't know MS. Right. Um, and if they're not aware of cooling also. Yeah. So um, what I, you know, and I've published a lot of research on this, the, one of the simplest things you can do to improve your exercise tolerance with MS is to take breaks. Okay? Instead of doing, you know, all the exercises at once, split them up over the course of the day. Instead of doing three sets of 10, which is done really more for the physical therapist's convenience than anything else, think instead maybe of 10 sets of three with long recoveries in between. Mm -hmm. You brought up the problem of heat. And one of the reasons that heat and fatigue are so intertwined is the longer you exercise, the higher your core temperature gets. And so if you take breaks, your core temperature has a chance to lower. Right. So if your physical therapist is unable to take that into account, that means they really do not know MS well enough. Thank you. Uh, Mar asks, do you have any opinion regarding incorporating a Feldenkrais practice with a PT program? Sure. I'm trying Feldenkrais to relax my tight neck problems. Any experience with it? Um, I love Feldenkrais. I've taken lots of classes in it. Um, I never, I didn't go all the way and, and get certified in it, but it's an excellent idea. The idea behind Feldenkrais is awareness through movement or ATM. And basically what it's, what the reason why I think it's helpful for people with MS is it makes them very aware of how they move. The more aware of your movements you become, the less energy it takes to perform a movement. And this is why it, um, so many persons I know with MS who've gone for Feldenkrais have told me their fatigue decreases because they've become more mindful about how they move. So I think Feldenkrais is an excellent option for people with MS. Um, some people um, have told me they find it a little bit too much, you know, new age kind of stuff. And I, I kind of get that, but in my mind, if it works, it works. Um, when I've tried, there have been some times I've tried to teach somebody Feldenkrais, but I would not call it Feldenkrais. I would call it, you know, motor learning training or or something like that, um, so that they don't think of it as something that's, you know, too far out. But the idea is the same. It's based in science. It's well studied. Um, there are several good papers on it. And I think it's it it's born up to scientific scrutiny. There's nothing really fancy about it. It's a technique by which you learn more about how to move better. And you do that by becoming more aware of how you move. It's very uh, it's very cause and effect based. So I'm a big fan. Thank you. Diane asks, are you familiar with PONS therapy? And if so, do you have any opinions on it? PONS, for those that are listening, is... Uh, Portable neuromodulation stimulator. I believe that's the therapy that um, they stimulate you through through your tongue. I believe. Um, please. There have been a few small scale studies which have shown maybe some benefit. Um, 
I, my feeling with PONS is my feeling with a lot of the higher tech interventions that have come out. Um, it would be great if it worked. Um, the research has not been overwhelmingly positive. It certainly, you know, hasn't caused any bad outcomes, but the it's an expensive intervention. Um, in the handful of patients who I've had who've gone through it, um, I have not seen any tremendous improvements. I wish that I would. It would be great. But, you know, I feel like every few years in MS, some new type of therapy comes up and it's, you know, the greatest thing and a lot of funding goes into it and a lot of people get interested in it. And everyone hopes that it works. Of course, I hope that it works. I haven't seen the hope yet. I haven't seen that been delivered on. Will PONS work? I don't know. Um, haven't seen it yet. It may. It works by, through stimulating the tongue, it sends stimulations to the brainstem. Um, uh, the scientific theory behind it is believable. There have not been a, anywhere near enough large-scale studies that have shown that it's effective. Um, if it is, if it is effective, you know, I'll be, if the science shows me that it's effective, I will sign up all the patients that I can, but so far it has not passed that test. Thank you. Uh, Luca has her hand raised or his hand raised. I'm not sure which Luca is. Um, Luca, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Luca, go to the lower right corner or lower left corner of your screen to the microphone icon and click on that and that should un unmute you. Okay, while Luca's trying to unmute, let's see. Okay, let's see here. Um, Well, Luca's trying to unmute. I'm going to ask the next question in the Q&A. Kimberly asks, can you provide a list or a website for patients, uh, for PTs who specialize in MS? There aren't any in my area, Fort Myers, Florida. Um, I think mscare.org has that list, don't they, of MS if certified? You, well, yes, they do, but I'll do you one better if you... Uh, uh, you can contact me directly and give me your zip code and I'll find somebody for you. Um, my email is herbcarppt at gmail.com. I think you can get it from, straight from MS Care. Um, and uh, this is something I do a lot of. I, I have this, I really hate the idea of people with MS who need physical therapy not being able to find the right physical therapist. So I'm very able and ready and willing to help people find them. So there is a list on MS Care. That's which, mscare.org. And we we can which we should post the link for. Um, but if you can't find anyone there, just contact me directly and I'll find someone for you. Yeah the the uh, help help email is info at mscare.org and and just ask them for a list of MS specialists in your area. Um, we have an anonymous attendee asking, how many times a week should a person with MS be treated for regular maintenance of walking better on the average? Realize it can be individualistic. Um, to be perfectly honest, every day. Um, but the day, it doesn't have to be with a physical therapist. Um, you, there, you should have a physical therapy program that you perform every single day because this is how change occurs this is how improvement occurs there's a word that some of you may have heard of called neuroplasticity and one of the ways that people improve from neurologic conditions such as ms is through neuroplasticity literally your nervous system changes as a result of what of your physical uh physical activities 
But in order for neuroplasticity to occur, there has to be a lot of repetition. And so if you're looking to improve your physical performance, you have to be practicing every single day. There's, it doesn't mean you have to work incredibly hard every day or hours every day, but it does have to be every day. My physical therapist noticed when I was walking, it wasn't something I was aware of or that my husband had seen. And she had me walk the corridor probably six times before she said, I think you're stepping on the outside of your left foot more than planting your foot flat. And so that became for me a daily mindfulness yes. and the way I placed my foot as I was walking. So I think that's what Dr. Karpatkin is talking about. You, you become aware of certain things that you just have to really incorporate into normal everyday things that you do. And, and it really is an everyday thing. Um, an anonymous attendee says, regarding primary progressive MS, is there any way to deter deterioration? Is a downward spiral just unavoidable? Oof. Um, well, let me start by saying MS is a progressive condition by definition. Um, does everybody progress at the same rate? No. I wrote an article for MS Care years ago called The Seven Habits of Highly Successful MSers. And in it, I talk about what are the characteristics of people who do the best despite their diagnosis, in particular, persons with, pro with progressive disease as opposed to relapsing remitting. And Obviously, I'm biased as a physical therapist, but one of the characteristics is these are people who exercise religiously. And this doesn't mean, you know, going to a gym and lifting weights and running on a treadmill, although that could certainly be part of it, but exercising in such a way that it specifically impacts the way that the MS has affected you. So will it stop your MS? No, I don't believe it will. Will it slow it down? Absolutely. And there's two specific reasons for that, which I want to go into right now. First of all, there's pretty solid evidence that exercise is in some way neuroprotective. And we know this because when they've done post-mortem examinations of people with MS, when they look at persons who have exercised throughout their whole life, as opposed to those who have not, the people who have been chronic exercisers simply have less disease than those who've not. So somehow exercise is protecting your nervous system. So that's one big reason. The other reason is more important to me as a physical therapist. There's two types of or there's two ways that MS can impact the way you move. One is what's called the primary way. It's due to the disease itself. It means that the disease has impacted part of your brain or part of your spinal cord that's responsible for your walking, for your balancing, for your speech, for your memory, for your movement. Okay? The secondary way, though, is that because you're moving less as a result of the MS, you become deconditioned. What this means is that a lot of the deterioration that I see in persons with MS isn't due to the disease, but it's due to the lifestyle changes that the disease has made you adopt. And this is where I will often work with patients, because that part of the disease, the secondary part, the part that's due to deconditioning and disuse, that part is reversible. And I believe that a lot of the disability that is seen in MS is because is due to this thing, not the disease itself, but the compensations that you make as a result of the disease. 
that the fact that because of the disease, you don't move as much, you get tired more easily, so you move less and exercise less, which makes you even less fit, which makes you move less, which makes you less fit. And there's this vicious circle. And one of the areas of my practice that I focus on is trying to interrupt that circle. Because again, I think a lot of the disability is not due to the disease, but it's a learned behavior. And therefore it can be unlearned. Thank you. Um, I can attest that deconditioning is a very real thing. And it used to make me so angry when somebody suggested that that might be the cause of my difficulty moving. Um, but it, it's very real and it just requires purposeful movement every single day. Um, we're recommending now that every individual with MS get at least 150 minutes of activity every single week. Um, and that can be things like uh, weeding the garden or uh, taking a walk or doing the laundry. It's activity. It's not necessarily hard exercise. So we do, have, we, do have, uh, we do have we do have we do have Luca Bianca Luca back okay. on the, on the chat. Um, I'm Bianca Luca. I'm 17 years old and diagnosed with MS for a year. I am from Romania. My mm. question is: What are the best practices for managing stress and anxiety? associated with multiple sclerosis? Mm, that's a great question. Um, stress and anxiety are, so they can be part of the disease itself, but it also can be a aspect, a, a response to the disease. The problem with stress and anxiety is that adds to the fatigue burden. Stress takes energy. Anxiety takes energy. Dr. Karpatkin has frozen for a moment. Um, I, I, Continuing along that vein, Bianca, I think a lot of stress and anxiety is due to the oh, not stress. knowing. There, there we go. He's back. You're back. Oh, did you lose me for a minute? We lost you for just about a minute. So you were just starting to talk about stress and anxiety okay. taking energy. And right. then we lost you. Okay. You got me back? We got you back. There we go. Um, stress and anxiety are important issues in multiple sclerosis because stress and anxiety will add to the fatigue load. So if I have a patient who does have stress and anxiety, and I know that it's com complicating their presentation, I will make sure that I give them some strategies for dealing with stress and anxiety. I think meditation, particularly mindfulness meditation, is very, very helpful. And I try to teach my patients that as much as possible. Sometimes they do need medication for their stress and anxiety from their neurologist or psychiatrist, something to limit that. Another thing is to learn what sorts of things trigger your stress and anxiety and to avoid them. Um, certainly drinking too much coffee is going to add to stress and anxiety. I know a lot of people with MS will drink a lot of coffee because it will, the caffeine will help them, but it's a false economy because it can also add to an increased heart rate and, and, and stress and anxiety, which adds to the fatigue load. Okay, thank um, you. I'm a big believer in mindful med mindfulness meditation for people with MS, really for all my patients, but particularly for MS. And this is actually something that has been well studied, that persons with MS who do engage in some type of meditative practice have less fatigue than those who do not. We have an anonymous attendee asking, if insurance is only willing to cover non-MS specialists, do you have any suggestions as to what wording might help when filling out an appeal to get an MS specialist covered as in-network? Well, the insurance companies are our friends and they only want to help us. <laughs> Sorry. Um, don't get me started. Um, well, to be, so I'm not sure I understand the question. Are you saying that there's no, that your therapists 
who are MS specialists are out of network and therefore uh, they're they're saying um uh that that if your insurance company has no in network MS oh. neurologists Oh, I see. Not PT. What is the wording that you might use to get the insurance company to make an exception and pay for it on an in-network schedule? I'm... Since I, I'm, I, I'm not quite sure what, how an insurance company would do that. They because it seems like they're advocating for you to get worse or care. Uh, an insurance company- If you have, a, if you have huh? a Medicare Advantage plan, for example, Medicare Advantage plans will often exclude specialists and you'll need to choose from just a small network of physicians. Um, and so many, net, or many Medicare Advantage plans only have general neurologists that are in network and covered by your insurance plan. So you have to pay out of pocket to see an MS specialist. Um, and, and they're wondering if there's any wording that might help. The, most insurance companies will entertain an appeal as a reason why you need to see a specialist rather than a general neurologist. Um, so it's a little outside of my role, but... In cases like that, a letter of medical necessity needs to be written where it's very clearly spelled out that because of the unique features of the multiple sclerosis, a general care is not appropriate and will actually re can result in a worse outcome than getting specialist care. And but higher yeah. overall cost. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think that that's, that's really the the way to go. Um, we've got quite a queue in the Q and A. Okay. <laughs> Ella, he says, why don't physical therapists who work with MS help the patient build muscle, which helps to improve movement? Why do they only work on movement rather than building muscle? Um, well, that's a good question. Um, MS. In M MS does not affect your muscles. MS affects your nervous system. The muscles may get smaller and weaker because you're not using them as much. But the this is not a disease of the muscle. This is a disease of the nervous system. When I see a patient, I'm not interested in getting their muscles bigger and stronger. I realize I have a limited amount of time with them because of their fatigue. So the problem is for an MS patient is not that their muscles have gotten weak. The problem is they can't walk or they can't balance or they can't sit up or they can't reach. So the, the, the state of the art in physical therapy right now is to work on the task. And this is very well borne out by science. If you're having problems with walking, the best thing you can do is to practice walking, not practice strengthening the muscles that you use for walking, but you have to do the walking itself. So if somebody, you know, if somebody is weak, okay, then even if you even if you practice the task, they will get stronger. I recently finished up with a patient who had a lot of weakness in her ankles and we measured the strength of her ankles and then we put her on a very aggressive twice a week, six week walking program. She did no strengthening exercises, but at the end of that program, her muscles were much stronger in her ankles. So I, as a PT, always look for the task. I'm not interested in big, strong muscles. I'm interested in how well the person can perform the movement. Okay. Um, if the person wants to develop big muscle size, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's not really going to help their MS so much. I actually had a patient once who was a bodybuilder with MS, and it was kind of odd because he had this rather magnificent muscular body, 
but he could barely walk. Okay. And, you know, it was his choice. I said, wouldn't you rather walk than have, you know, big deltoids and biceps? And he said, well, no, I'd rather look good. So yeah. um, it, was an, it was an interesting conversation we had. So, uh, we, we, we have so, Tammy from um, asking, is dry needling good for MS? And my, I have not seen tremendous effects from it. I recently completed a study on acupuncture and MS, which is not exactly the same thing as dry needling, but it's similar, and we did not see a profound effect. I know some of my patients who've had dry needling or acupuncture have said they felt more comfort and less pain as a result. Once again, I try to work as a scientist, and the research just isn't there. Um, the I do know that dry needling or acupuncture has helped a handful of patients who've had a lot of pain syndromes due to MS. In terms of it reversing or even stabilizing the course of the disease, I've not seen any evidence of that. I've again, uh, first, many of I've, my patients have told me that yeah, I feel great afterwards. They can't tell me why they feel great, but they 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 do say that, and so I pay attention to that. I've personally had uh, three um, courses of dry needling with my physical therapist, and every one of them has not helped. So I, I have not seen any improvement with it. So that's just anecdotal for me. But yeah. um, it certainly probably wouldn't hurt to try it, but just do so with an open mind. Um, Nia is asking, I'm newly diagnosed this past October with relapsing remitting MS. I was already in PT for hip pain from my desk job. My numbness and tingling have remitted. Is there something else I should be focusing on in physical therapy? You should be focusing on whatever aspects of your mobility have been impaired by the MS. And in 90% of all people with MS, their gait and their balance is impaired in some way. So it's the PT's job to examine your gait and examine your balance, find how the MS has impacted it, and give you an exercise program that addresses that specific impact. Thank you. Um, Bianca from Facebook is asking, what foods should I be eating to avoid, uh, should I be avoiding to better my eating habits? Um, Bianca, if you would like to send me an email, it's sherry, that's C-H-E-R-I-E -E, at msfocus.org. I will be happy to have a conversation with you about it so that Dr. Karpat can, can focus on the physical therapy questions that are coming in. Um, Vess is saying, what is your opinion about the tau patch and is it trustworthy? Um, somebody asked me about that recently. I was unaware of it. I went to the site. Um, I'm uh, a scam. It's an absolute scam. Um, it, I've been looking into this for about two years now, and there are all kinds of glowing testimonials on it. And everybody that I've talked to that's tried it has said that it does absolutely nothing. As as they say, if something seems too good to be true, it almost certainly is. Um, you know, I want, my, my professional life is multiple sclerosis. I want people with MS to get better. I want it badly. And I, so when I come across something that makes this claim, you know, I would I like to give it the benefit of the doubt. If this works, that's great. That's amazing. But at the same time, you have to accept the fact that there's people who say, well, I have a nice, you know, captive audience here. I'll make some claim and maybe make a few bucks off it. Um, and I see that more than I want to. Um, you know, so what I what do I do? I recommend the things that I know that works. Those know that work. Exercise works. Disease modifying therapy works. Lifestyle adaptations work. Um, putting a, a patch on your arm won't work. I wish that it did. That would be great. Yeah. Okay. 
There are some people say they can cure exercise. They can cure MS with diet. That would be great. It's not true. Okay. You can have a good impact on the MS with good diet, but you're not going to cure it. Elizabeth is asking your thoughts on the psionic neural sleeve. Ah, <sighs> um, handful of my patients are using it. Um, it's basically a fancy type of electrical stimulation. Um, I could say at best for a handful of my patients, it's made some small improvements. If you have a very, very specific focal weakness in your leg, it could be effective. For my patients who have more profound weakness in multiple areas of their legs, uh, it's just, it's really just not enough. Um, it's somewhat reminiscent of a device called the Bioness or the WalkAid that uses electrical stimulation to activate certain muscles at certain points in the gait cycle. And it works in a very limited number of cases, but it does work. Um, I have not, you know, I've worked with patients who've had it. I've met with members of the company. I, you know, I'm not saying that it's worthless. I think, again, a small number of people, it seems to have offered some help to. It is not, uh, it is very, very, very far from a panacea. Thank you. Um, Caroline's at, asking, is stretching the primary activity that you recommend for your MS patients? Um, no. Um, the answer to that is it depends. If their muscles are tight and the tightness is interfering with their movement, yes. But um, stretching is not the the only thing that I see in persons with MS. For some people, the stretching isn't as much of an issue as strength or coordination or control or lack of sensation. A large number of people with MS do have stretch, do have muscle tightness problems, usually in their calf muscles. And I would say the vast majority of my patients do have stretching as part of their own program. But that doesn't mean 100% of all people with MS need a stretching program. I would say probably about 80, 85% do. Um, and you're not going to hurt, or it's very hard to hurt yourself by stretching too much. I could think of one or two patients who actually did stretch too much because they thought a little is good, so more is better. And it actually ended up, in one patient, it injured them. Another one, it got their muscles too loose and it made it harder for them to stand. So stretching is always good, but the stretching program, excuse me, the stretching program should be devised and administered by a physical therapist so you know what exactly is the right stretch for the right muscle at the right frequency at the right amount of time. Thank you. Um, Beverly uh, has written quite a story. I'm going to just cut it down a little bit. She's 66. Um, she's ha she was diagnosed with secondary progressive in 2003. Um, she's been walking every day for over a year now and feels like she can do more, but her leg is still giving her some problems. So she's wondering if there are certain exercises that can maybe strengthen her core that would help. Um, well, so the short answer is yes, of course. And um, very often I will see a patient who... Their leg looks weak, but when we stabilize their core, the leg gets much stronger. So without seeing you, I don't know if it's a core problem or if there's a leg issue that is not getting the attention that it needs. But uh, one of the simplest tests you can do to see if it's a core issue is that the next time you feel your walking is becoming, excuse me, is becoming difficult, stabilize your core, and that means tighten your abdominals, tighten your glutes, and then try to keep walking while you're keeping those muscles tight. And it's not unusual that I'll see a patient who is having trouble walking, and I give them a home exercise program which specializes, which, which specifically looks at activating and strengthening the core, and their walking improves quite a bit. 
without seeing you, I can't tell whether that's the right thing for you, but <laughs> but it's certainly worth a try to see that if you tighten those muscles while you walk to see if your walking improves. That's helpful information. Thank you. Um, an anonymous attendee asks, what is the best recumbent bike program weekly, such as minutes and times per week for someone with MS? Oof. Well, when you ask me a question like that, I have to ask the best for what? Um, probably, you know, if I was forced to answer, the best thing would probably be some type of high interval, high intensity interval training, where instead of going steady state, you would intersperse periods of really, really high intense work, high repetition, you know, high repetitions for say 30 to 60 seconds, and then go very, very slowly for another 30 to 60 seconds. Try and get your heart rate up and try to really push your legs as hard as you can, and then give yourself a period of time to recover. But okay. Have a the problem with stationary biking um, is it's not that stationary biking is not helpful. It is, but stationary biking is not the same thing as walking. And if you get better at stationary biking, it will it is unlikely it'll carry over to your walking. If you practice a lot of stationary biking, you will get better and better at stationary biking, but it will probably not carry over into your walking. All right. Thank you. Um, and as a follow-up on that, Elihi, who asked a question earlier, asks, what type of exercise do you recommend to someone who has difficulty walking? Well, again, it'll depend on why you're having the difficulty. Is it because of weakness? Is it because of tightness? Is it because of loss of sensation? Is it because of lack of, of motor control and coordination? Without seeing you, I can't tell, but what I would suggest is the most, probably the best thing you can do is increase the volume of your walking, the dose. How can you do, excuse me, uh, the greatest amount of walking that you can? So what I will often give new patients to do is an intermittent walking program. I'll say, I know you can't walk for five or 10 minutes at a time, but try walking for two to three minutes sit down and recover, then do another two to three minutes, sit down and recover. So you're always either walking or recovering. Walking without a break is just gonna slowly raise your core temperature and slow you down. So I'm a big believer in having you take breaks. Walk for a bit, recover. Walk for a bit, recover. Walk for a bit, recover. Thank you. Um, an anonymous attendee is asking if there are certain exercises that are helpful for painful knee osteoarthritis. Um, again, without seeing the knee, I can't tell, but the one, here's what I do know. Probably the worst thing you could do for your knee, if it's hurting as a result of arthritis, is stop moving it. The knee will get more stuck and more frozen. So the more mobility you put your knee through, the better it's going to do. It won't reverse the osteoarthritis or the osteoporosis, but it will allow you to function more and move better. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to let attendees know that Dr. Karpatkin needs to leave a couple of minutes before five o'clock. So we've got seven questions in the Q&A right now, um, and we're just going to try to burn through those so that you each get the attention you need. Um, an anonymous attendee asks about what are some good balance exercises. <clears throat> so, Dr. Karpatkin, what are some good balance exercises? Oh, what are some good balance? Well, probably the best balance exercise is to find a position where your balance is challenged but does not lead to a fall and try to hold that position as long as possible. In order to improve at balance, you need to you need to challenge your balance. So again, balance can get worse because of deconditioning, because of learned non-use. This is something I see all the time. Somebody's having trouble balancing, so they'll stop trying to challenge their balance, which makes their balance worse. 
which makes them stop trying to balance it even more. So when I'm seeing somebody who's trouble, who's trouble ba balancing, one of the first things I'll do is I'll find what positions they can get into which challenge their balance. And that's what will make them practice. This could be something like standing with your feet all both close together, touching in the center, standing with your feet closed together and uh, your eyes open or your eyes closed, standing with one foot in front of the other, standing on a foam surface. The idea is to find a position that challenges your balance. Okay, If it's too easy, your balance is not going to improve because it's not being challenged. There's nothing to adapt to. If it's too hard, your balance is not going to improve because you never have a chance to use your skills. So you need to get yourself into a position where your balance is challenged. For many people, that could be as simple as standing with your feet together, eyes closed. It could be as simple as standing on an unstable platform like a foam, uh, like a foam disc. Uh, it can be standing on one foot. It could be standing while you move your head. But the main thing to do is to look for a position that challenges your balance. And that's what you should practice. Thank you. Kimberly asks, what would be your first step in getting someone out of a wheelchair full time? Well, it would depend on why they're in the wheelchair for the first, in the first place. Um, if they're in a wheelchair and their uh, legs are completely immobile, um, there's not a lot of options. You can try bracing, things like that. But if they're in a wheelchair, because it's easier than walking, my goal would be to try to get them out of the wheelchair as fast as possible. Even if they can only take two or three steps at a time. Maybe if you do two or three steps today, maybe by tomorrow you could do three or four and the next day four or five. Okay. But the more you're in the wheelchair, the harder it is to get out of one. So I would strongly recommend that if you're in a wheelchair, um, see what you can do outside of the wheelchair. If you can't walk a great distance, walk a short distance. If you can't walk a, a few steps, then just practice standing. But the best way to get out of a wheelchair is to get out of a wheelchair. I agree. I spent about two years totally scooter dependent. Really? And uh, with about six months of purposeful activity, I no longer even needed a cane. <laughs> so um, it you, you can do it, but it takes a real commitment to yeah. do it. Um, Brenda says, what is the process for improving or establishing neuroplasticity? Is consistent walking productive or is it better to do exaggerated steps? I especially exercise by walking in chest deep water. So there's a couple rules for neuroplasticity and I'm gonna repeat the most well-known ones here first. The first rule is use it or lose it. If you don't practice a task, you're going to lose the ability to do that task. Therefore, keep doing the task. The next role is use it and improve it. Okay? Meaning the more you practice a task, the better you're going to get good at it. Walking in the water sounds like an okay activity, but the problem is, is that it's not the same as walking on dry land, which is where you really need to walk. And that brings us to the third rule of neuroplasticity, the rule of specificity. If you want to get good at something, you have to practice that thing. Okay? Improving in a task that's unrelated to another task is not going to result in improvement. So my kind of smart ass answer to you would be walking in water is going to get you very good at walking in water, but it is not necessarily going to carry over into walking over ground on dry land. So uh, use it or lose it, use it and improve it, specificity and another rule is the for of neuroplasticity is the rule of salience meaning that whatever you do you have to know why you're doing it and you have to have some connection with the exercise what is the connection between what you want and what the exercise provides 
salience is knowing why you're doing what you're doing, why this exercise is meaningful to you. Thank you. An anonymous attendee asks for your opinion on TENS units with people with MS. Um, TENS units, uh, again, they're not, they're far from a panacea. Um, a lot of my patients have ended up using them to, uh, to deal with some of the pain syndromes associated with MS. I have not seen it have any significant effect on walking or balance. But for pain relief, it's usually okay. Now, Ella, he was the person that asked about getting out of the wheelchair. And, uh -huh. she's, in, uh, and she's in the wheelchair because of weakness and tightness. Mm -hmm. So wanted to know where to start uh, to get out of the wheelchair. Well, and, and the... you you addressed it with just just make it a point to get out of the wheelchair and work it. If she's um, not strong enough to get out of the wheelchair on her own, then you should try to get out of the wheelchair with some assistance, either a therapist holding you up or holding yourself up with your hands in the parallel bars, or even using something like a standing frame or a tilt table. But you want to get yourself out of the chair as much as you can. Now, um... Antoine asks, what can I do when legs always feel heavy and unstable? Um, rest them and stretch them. Okay. A big mistake with people with MS that I find is that when uh, they start feeling really fatigued, their legs feel heavy or unstable, they try to push through it. They try to break through the pain. And that's actually counterproductive. When you start to feel like your eggs are, legs are getting tired and stiff and you're having trouble picking them up, that's a sign you need to take a break for a minute. Thank you. And one last question. Kimberly asks, have you seen Cadence, C-A-D-E-N-S-E, shoes for foot drop? And if so, what are your thoughts? Not familiar with them. All um, right. Thank uh, you. Yeah. I think uh, foot drop is a major problem with MS, and what I've found works the best is a prolonged stretching and strengthening program for the ankle, getting rid of shoes that have a super high heel wedge, and really focus when you walk on landing on your heel and pushing up from your toe. Thank you. I'm going to let you go off camera. Thank you so Thanks. much, and Thank get you, to everybody. your appointment. And um, if you all will stay on the line for just a minute, other than Dr. Karpakian, which we will see later, and thank you again. Okay. Um, go, uh, go ahead and stay on as we finish the conference for a brief survey to let us know what you're interested in seeing for future conferences. Our next conference is going to be next Tuesday, the 5th of March, and it will be Dr. Daniel Cantor, um, on the topic of, is your disease modifying therapy working? So please join us on the 5th of March at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you. And from all of us at MS Focus, we appreciate you. I Bye -bye. appreciate you. Thank you, everyone.